charisma. Can we give Jesus another clap of praise? Come on, somebody. Amen. Let's give the Lord the best clap of praise in the house today. Those of you who are watching online, type in the emoji, clap, 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 clap. Praise the Lord. Amen. My name is James. I'm one of the pastors here. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you to the church for all nations. We are in a series from the book of Ephesians. What we do here is we study the Bible book by book. That's why we, we, we learn the scripture better that way. And we have this uh, theme that we we following wealth, walk, warfare. Everybody say wealth. wealth. Everybody say walk. Wow. Everybody say warfare. That as Christians, we are wealthy in the Lord. How many of you know that everything that you need, God has already provided for? Come on, somebody. We just need to claim it. Come on, somebody. Claim it by faith. Amen. Everything that we'll be needing in life, God has already answered. The number one need is salvation. He answered already at the cross once and for all. Our forgiveness of our sins. And then what we'll be needing in life, everybody say walk. Everybody say walk. How do we walk this out? How will we live this Christian life in this dark, dark world? And then we need to know, everybody say warfare. At the count of three, everybody say warfare. warfare. Everybody say warfare. There is a spiritual war that we are involved. Probably some of you don't know, and I don't want you to be ignorant. Because if you're ignorant, you can be a casualty of war. There's demonic forces. I will be asking somebody today to share a little bit a demonic encounter. A woman possessed by the de demons. Six men is trying to stop her. And those six men just flew all over the room. And I will tell you, and I will ask the, our pastor how he delivered them, how he set them free. So we are in a war. But I want to let you know, tell the person next to you, you're on the winning side. Would you stand up on your feet and begin to recite our prayer today? Are there any warriors in the house? Are there any princess warrior in the house? Come on, let's lift our hands. Come on, let's lift our hands. This is not religious. This is a, this is a sign of where you're reporting for duty, sir. Everybody pray this with me. Heavenly Father, your warrior prepares for battle today. I claim victory over Satan by putting on the full armor of God. Let's continue praying this. I put on the belt of truth. May I stand firm in the truth of your word. So I will not be victim of Satan's lies. Let's continue to pray. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. May it guard my heart from evil. So I will remain pure and holy. Protected under the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's continue praying. Let's put on the shoes of peace. May I stand firm in the goodness of the gospel. So your peace will shine through me. And be a light to all I encounter. Let's put on the shield of faith. I put on the shield of faith. May I be ready for Satan's fiery darts of doubt, denial, and deceit. So I will not be vulnerable to spiritual defeat. And let's put on the helmet. I put on the helmet of salvation. May it keep my mind from focus on you. So Satan will have that stronghold on my thoughts. And I put on the sword of the Spirit. May the two-edged sword of the Word may be ready in my hands so I can escape the tempting words of Satan. And by faith, your warrior has put on the armor of God. Is day in spiritual victory. Everybody say amen. Amen. You cannot be seated. Come on. Come on. So after Paul taught us using the analogy of a Roman soldier, and then he shifted to something spiritual, something that uh, is not the armor like the Roman soldier is wearing. Right after that, he said this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, and he said, and, everybody say, and. Yes. What do you do when you're talking, and then you say, and this it's a connection, right? You're still talking about that subject. And you're adding this. And then Paul says, 
And this is also very important, Paul says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert, always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And then he asked for prayer requests as a pastor. Say, please pray for me so that whenever I speak the word be given, I will do this fearlessly and make known the mystery of the gospel. Everybody say pray. Everybody say pray. So I want to share to you the spiritual weapon and tactics. So we need to know when we are in a war, we need to be equipped. Everybody say spiritual weapon. So the spiritual weapon that we're going to talk about is something about binding and losing. And I'll explain that to you later on. Uh, it's very, very powerful. We had a, a breakthrough this morning in our morning service. It's so amazing. And I believe you're going to experience this too. Come on, somebody. How many of you want to experience the fullness of God? Come on, somebody. Amen. How many of you want to be set free? Come on. Come on, somebody. Amen. Whatever is that's holding you back, God could set you free. So this is what the weapons that Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, 5. He says, the weapons we fight are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, it has divine power to demolish stronghold. We demolish this argument and every pretension that set itself against the knowledge of God. We take captive, everything captive, every thought, and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, I shared about the helmet of salvation. Everybody say, the battle's on the mind. What comes out of your mind comes of your life. You cannot live a positive life with a negative mind. If you don't like the direction of your life right now, have you checked lately what's the direction of your thoughts? It's a pathway. What have you been thinking, thinking lately? That's very, very important. That's why we need to take captive every thought. For example, when the devil will say, hey, you're going to lose. You're going to die. You're not going to make it. You held that captive. No, in Jesus' name. Philippians 4, 13 said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Could somebody say amen? amen? That's taking captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ, the word of God. This is the Bible. So now, I want to share this message. It's very, very important because in the art of war, we have some soldiers here, militaries, marines, servicemen who serve in the military. In the art of war, a French general was asked, which army is winning? How do you know if your army is winning? One answer from the general, the army that is advancing. No army that retreats win. But the army, sometimes they retreat to reload, but they come back into the fight. At the end of the day, the army that marches and advances win the war. Can I ask you today, Charisma, Christians, we are called not to hide. We are not called to retreat. We are not to call to sell our houses in Washington because it's hard to be a Christian and move to the Bible Belt in Texas. They need more Jesus here in Washington. Come on, somebody. They need the church here in Seattle. Can somebody say amen? amen. Everybody say, we're not afraid. Everybody say, we're not afraid. Everybody say, we're on the winning side. Now, I double in theology and history today because this is very important. Do you know the first time the church is mentioned in the New Testament? Where was it? And can I ask you this question too? Who invented this word church? Because church is not mentioned in the Old Testament synagogue, temple. Could somebody talk back to me, Charisma? Who invented the word church? And I'll be so easier to answer. Who is the head of the church? Jesus. Who is the head of the church? Jesus. I want you to shout it out. Who is the head of the church? Jesus. So Jesus invented the church. This is Jesus' idea. Now, this is very important. Do you know where he mentioned it? Matthew chapter 6, verse 18. This is the first time. This is a revelation. We know now what the church, right? By the way, the church is not the building. The church, the people that God has called. This is the first time. Church, the Jewish people, what's that? And then Jesus said, I'll tell you, Peter, on this rock, 
I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Everybody say, the church is on the offensive. The church is on the offensive. Have you ever seen armies with the weapons of the gates? What are gates for? Can you talk back to me? What are gates for? Why do you put gate in your house? Come on. To what? To protect, right? Because if you don't put gates, oh my gosh, you're inviting all the burglars. Hey, come on in. Gates is to prohibit people from coming in. Have you seen an army marching in the command? Come on, let's take our gates and attack. No, they're retreating. And hold forth the gates. Prevent the enemy from coming in. So the point I'm trying to say, Jesus said, the protection of the devil, the gates cannot stop the movement and the moving of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say, can we just give Jesus a clap of praise for this? Come on, somebody. COVID tried to stop the church, but the church of God is still moving. Come on, somebody. Amen, somebody. The devil wants to shut you down, but you're still alive, and you're here in the, words, in the house of God, and you're worshiping Jesus. Can you give yourself a hand for being in the house of God? Come on, somebody. Now, this is very important. I came from the Philippines. We grew up in a tradition that teaches us that Peter is the rock and God built the church on Peter. I'm sorry to say that's not the Bible. Jesus did not say, and I tell you the truth, you are Peter and on you I will build my church. Did Jesus say that? What Jesus said, on this rock, he's not talking to Peter, he's talking about another kind of rock. This is why we need to understand the language of the original Bible, New Greek. There are two words for rock in the Bible. Peter is Petros. Everybody say Petros. Everybody say Petros. What, uh, those are the ones that when you are gardening and you put those white pebbles, that's Petros, little rocks. The word rock here and on this rock, he was saying, everybody say Petra. Have you heard about Petra in Jordan? It's a bedrock. And then they did some uh, uh, sculpturing then and building. It's called Petra. That's the word that Jesus is using here. I will build my church on the rock. Not you, Peter. You're a little rock. But God is saying on the rock. And I'll show you that we're exactly where that is. So today I'm going to share a message about build and battle. Everyone say build and battle. Everybody say, build and battle. How many of you know if you're building something, get ready for a battle? Come on, church. You're building your house, you're building your marriage, you're building a business. Get ready to get a fight. Get ready to be attacked. Sometimes get ready to be gossiped about. Get ready to be slandered. Because whenever you're building, God, the enemy is saying, attack, divide, conquer, stop the building. But I want you to know that keep building and battling because are on the winning side. Now, we're going to go now in history. Follow me, Charisma. This is very powerful. So this is the first time Jesus mentioned a church. How many of you know in real estate, I'm not a realtor, but in real estate, there are three words that are the most important. What is the most important words in real estate? Location. One, one two, three. Say it. Uh, location. What? Location. Everybody say what? Location. When Jesus said this, he did not mention it in Jerusalem. He took his disciples to a field trip. You know, back in the day, they don't have like classroom like we do at the University of Washington. The, how the rabbi teaches, he would say, come, follow me. Literally, they will follow you. Go to your house, eat with you, sleep with you. That's literally it's not like, uh, I follow you on Instagram, like, or I unfollow you. No, no, no. The word follow there is literal. They follow you wherever you go. So when Jesus said, come follow me, this is a big thing. Every rabbi, listen to me carefully, there's one place they prohibit their disciples to go. Caesarea Philippi. Everybody say Caesarea Philippi. Because that is the headquarters of Satan. This is where Jesus mentioned the church. Read this me, Charisma. 
Then Jesus came to the, everybody say, read, read this, Caesarea Philippi. And he asked his disciples, who do people say? The Son of Man is a title for the Messiah. Everybody says Caesarea Philippi. That is a place for every Jew should not even step on. Because it's so evil. It's so demonic. It's just like the headquarters of Satan, literally. What's there? Let's show you the, the map. The war that is happening right now in that area. The Palestinians, that's in that area. The Golan Heights, Syria, Caesarea, Philippi. Why is that place so evil, Pastor? Because the word Caesar, Ria, Caesar. Caesar proclaimed that he's the king of the world. Caesar proclaimed he's the king of the universe. Caesar proclaimed he's the savior of the world. So this name was meant, uh, put the name of Caesar. And you know who's Philippi? The number one enemy of Jesus. Remember when Jesus was here on earth, there was a King Herod who wanted to kill all the babies. That's Herod the Great. His son is Philip. So this is the combination of two, 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 the evil rulers, the king of uh, uh, Roman, and then the emperor, and they call this place the Caesarea Philippi. And in that place, you will see there, if you go there to, to Jerusalem or to Israel next year or sometime, that Caesarea Philippi, 25 miles away from Sea of Galilee up to the north, there's only one mountain in Israel that, that has snow. It's called Mount Hermon. At the foot of the mountain is the boundary of Lebanon and the boundary of uh, Syria, the Caesarea Philippi. And there's uh, like waters flowing there from Jordan River. This is what they call the gates of hell. I'll explain to you what's the meaning of the gates of in, 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 uh, in Hebrew is Hades. Hades means the underworld. Show it to you. That is exactly where Jesus said, everybody reads together. Let's look, look at the next slide. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not stop it. Explain, pastor, what's, what's the, the gates of Hades? Because that is the entrance to the worship of a Greek idol, idolatry. Greek mythology invaded Israel too. Have you heard about the God of Pan? Look at this, the God of Pan. You see the temple of Pan all the way there. And then you will see this. It's a big cave. And they said that's the gates of Hades, the gates of underworld. What's the meaning of Pan? The god of Pan is a Greek god that is half man, half goat. It's so evil. This is the censored back picture because I cannot show you the, the, original, the other picture because it's a god of lust. And the God of fright, that's where we get the word panic. God of pan, panic, pandemonium. Because people are afraid to go there. Because, and now, how do you appease the God of pan? This is what they would ask you to do. You will cut the head of the goat. And you will throw it on the, show that, that cave again, show that cave. You will throw it inside. And there's water there. If your goat, the head of the goat stays under, means the God of Pan accepted your offering and you'll be okay in life. You don't need to be afraid. But if the head of the goat float, you're in danger. So that's, that's, that's panic, that's fright, and pandemonium. So imagine the fear that that place creates, and it's so evil. And to the point, literally church, church history, to the point that people will even sacrifice their children. Throw it there to appease the God of Pan. That is the place where Jesus said, this place that is so evil, I will penetrate this and I will build my church because Jesus is greater than Satan. Could somebody say amen? amen. Pastor Ariel went there together with some of their guys. So here's Pastor Ariel. I just want to put it there because I like the beanie. <laughs> Go Hawks. This is the exact rendering from the artist, what you would see during the time of Jesus. Look at this picture. That's why it's so evil. That's the gate of, gate of Hades. And you know what Caesar did? He built himself a temple. Temple 
of Augustus, Caesar Augustus. And then another temple, God of Zeus. And then here's we're really, 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 really so bizarre and really X-rated that bestiality is happening there, and goats, and then this, to, and it's so evil. I want you to see that. That is the place where Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not stop. That's why I ask you, church, no matter how evil you're seeing in this world right now, the church is advancing and moving and we're proclaiming the gospel one person at another and people are being saved, healed, and delivered. Could somebody say amen? amen? Now, what are gates in the Bible? It's not just for defense. What is the significance of gates in the Bible? Gates is a place of power, influence, and business. You go to the medieval time, like the gates, enter the gates, and then there's a the marketplace, there's the judge, there's a court. So that's a gate where often the place where leaders would meet to discuss affairs of state and settle legal matters. It is a place of power and influence. Remember when uh, God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's this one Hebrew person who becomes so worldly, become part of Sodom. When the angel went there and Lot was sitting at the gates, became like he's one of the leaders of Sodom. So here's a verse of scripture about gates, Zechariah chapter 8, 16. Would you please read this with me? These are the things you shall do. Each speaks, speak each man to the truth of his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice. So that's the place of power, influence, and prestige. And here's what God is saying. The defense of the devil gates and the power of the devil and the influence of the devil could not stop the move of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. And that's why the church is on the offensive. I want to say this. Jesus is offensive. Jesus is offensive. When Jesus comes to your life, he will not say, are you with me? You cannot just say that to him. He doesn't want to join you. He wants to take over your life. I'm just saying this, Charisma. When Jesus comes to your life, he's offensive. There are certain things in your life that you were doing, and then Jesus said, hey, who, there's a new sheriff in town. I am the Lord now, not you. And there are certain ways that we need to do because Jesus said it. Amen, somebody? I just want to put that, that out, that uh, Jesus is not just a... Because some people call you, Jesus is my homeboy. There's no power in that. It's just a homeboy. Come on, I say, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> now, I want to show you a true video story that we should be on the offensive. Because an army that is retreating cannot win. And an army that's just laying down and staying down cannot do anything. I showed this to one of my live groups. You know, when we were in uh, Montenegro, Montenegro is part of Yugoslavia, a small resort town. Very nice place. There's a fortress there. But this little country is known for laziness. If you go to Europe, who are the laziest people in Europe? Oh, the Montenegros. Montenegrinism, they even have a word for that. Because people there are lazy. So the Montenegros, they're not offended. Said, if you call us lazy, we're hold to that. <laughs> We're proud of that. They even have a lazy competition every year. For 12 years, who will be the laziest citizen? Takes the price of 1,000 euro dollar. All you need to do, lay down. Everybody say, lay down. Stay down. Everybody say, lay down. Stay down. We were there and we were there asking, who's going to win this year? Who's going to what? Olympics? No, it's about the laziest competition. So this is how they do it. You get to bring your bed, your gadget, and you gather together and lay down and stay down for how many days? It started in August and last month was also September still going on. It's on the news. Let's just watch this. The laziest citizen is a title most American workaholics may not want, but in the Baltic country of Montenegro, more than a dozen people are vying for the crown to be named laziest of them all. Kelsey Kernstein has the story. 
In a small village in northern Montenegro, there's a contest of sorts where the only skill needed is laziness. And so the unmotivated came. 21 sloth-like contestants entered the competition where laying down, sleeping, and doing nothing is not only encouraged, but required. All in a quest to be known as the least energetic, slackful, shiftless person in Montenegro. We organized this lying down competition as a parody, playing on the stereotype that Montenegrins are lazy to see who could endure it the longest. Currently, there are seven contestants out of the 21 who applied this year. But only one can win the title of the laziest citizen and a grand prize of $1,000. The annual contest challenges lazy participants to lay down and stay down longer than anybody else. Stand or city are a violation of the rules and grounds for immediate disqualification. Although everyone has their needs, so contestants get a 10-minute bathroom break every eight hours. Well, aside from the absence of family, everything else is easy because we have literally everything we need here. And the other contestants are fantastic, so time flies. The rules are simple. Contestants are allowed to eat, drink, read, use their cell phones and laptops. But they must do it while lying down. It's been about 24 days since the start of the competition. That's roughly 600 hours of rest and relaxation for the remaining seven contestants. Compare that to last year's winner, who spent 117 hours lying down. And these sleepyheads have already smashed the previous record. But no matter who wins, it seems the Montenegro stereotype is safe, and their lifestyle promoting leisure and relaxation is in good hands. Kelsey Kernstein, News Nation. Thank you for watching. Go to news. Everybody say, lay down. Stay down. It's not allowed here. <laughs> Amen so much. Everybody say, we're on the move. We, you cannot even spell the word God without the word go. Come on, somebody. Amen. So if we do this, we're not going to move the mission of Jesus. So we need to build and battle. And how do we do this? Because here's, I want you to see charisma. After Jesus said, on this rock, where there's evil forces, there's pain, there's sin, I want to build church, meaning I'm going to conquer this. How many of you have thanked God that we were once in darkness, but now we're in the kingdom of light? Can we just celebrate that? Come on, somebody. Can we just celebrate that? Come on. Can we just celebrate that? We did some horrible things in our life that we're not proud of, but praise the Lord. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Can we give Jesus a clap of praise for that? Amen, somebody. Because God is moving your life. So now, how do we keep the devil out? Everybody say binding. Everybody say losing. So after Jesus said this, he gave them the keys of the kingdom. Would you please read this with me, Charisma? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of God, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Everybody say binding, losing. This is very important. Jesus mentioned it again. I said, Hey, guys, so, so don't, you don't you forget, okay? This is how we conquer the enemy. In, and we, 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 we withdraw the, release the enemy's victim. We have to know how to bind and lose. And then he said it again, Matthew 18. 18. Everybody say it again. Jesus said, truly, I'll tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Binding and loosing. Now, the word binding and loosing is not an English term. It's a Hebraic rabbinic term. It's just like uh, for us Washingtonians. When we talk about Starbucks, what comes to your mind? Come on, charisma talk back. When you talk about Starbucks, what comes to your mind? Ta try mentioning that in Europe, especially in places like the Baltic area, not, not, not the big city. What's Starbucks? What's that? Is that a star and then a box? No. Oh, it's coffee, coffee. No, they don't know it because it's, a, it's an American thing. Binding and losing is not an American thing, but it's an Israeli thing. A rabbi will teach his disciples how to bind and loose. The word binding means to ever say to prohibit. Ever say to prohibit. Everybody say to permit. So once again, one, two, three. To prohibit. Everybody say to permit. How many of you would like to prohibit the move of the devil in your family? Could somebody say amen? How many of you would like to prohibit the attacks of the devil upon your finances? Come on, somebody. Amen. Amen. Now, here's the key. You could make it stop, and then you could also lose, meaning untie 
the victims who have been attacked by d demons. So that's a term that I want you to see. And between Malachi and Matthew, it's called interstamental literature. That's why there's a lot of books written there, not, not in the Bible. But part of the literary uh, teaching there is about binding and loosing. They know that. So that when Jesus mentioned that, ah, I know that, to prohibit and to loose. Binding demons and loosing their victims. I want to call Pastor Morok, one of our awesome pastors at Charisma. Did you know that we have a Marshallese church at Charisma? Come on, somebody. Can we give a clap of praise? We are the church for all nation. Last week or this week, he was called for an assignment. Because there is a person who was demon-possessed. And they called the pastor to exercise these demons. And I want you to hear word for word what happened in this demonic encounter. This is Pastor Morok, our Marshallese pastor. Well, glory to Jesus. Amen. So, um, my wife and I got this call to come to a family home in SeaTac. A lady called and said, Pastor, could you come and lay your hand and pray for this lady who's uh, demon-possessed? And uh, I said, what did you say? She's what? Demon-possessed. And, you know, I tried to make up an excuse not to go. <laughs> I mean, I, I saw a movie many, many years ago about that little girl <laughs> sitting in front of the TV and past mid midnight, she goes, they're back. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I thought, that thing's going to kill me. It's going to destroy my life. But it also reminded me of what it says in the Bible that if the sun sets you free, oh, yes. mm, you are free indeed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we picked up a deacon, one of our deacon and a pastor. And we drove to the house in SeaTac. And we walked in the house, saw the family was all gathered in the living room, and they, they were pointing to a room on the left. And we could hear commotion coming out of that room. When we walked inside, we, I saw this lady laying on the, on the floor with sick men on top of her, pinning her. So she didn't move. And every time she was doing this, move her arm, she threw the guys to the wall. She was so strong. And um, the pastor looked at me, the digging, turned and said, oh, she's strong. <laughs> but I said, nah, I have faith. Jesus is stronger. And um, somehow she knew, she knew that we were about to pray. She stopped moving. She looked at us. But you could see her eyes, nothing but white. You don't see the black. And um, so we, we start praying. When I, I closed my head, eyes and I start praying, I, I, could, I thought I was hearing a cat, you know, how the sound very, very thin, but she was, she was singing one of the hymns, I surrender all. I surrender all. Oh, sound very, very good. And now, but we prayed. It was a brutal battle, praying our faith against the devil. But we prayed. Probably a long, it was a long, long battle, probably three, four hours. But we kept praying, praying, praying. And she was jumping all around the room very quick, like, like a cat. She jumped to the corner, looking at us, jumped to the other corner. But I said, grab her, let's do it again. Don't stop. We keep praying, keep praying. And all of a sudden, you know, God released her. She stood up and she said, what, what, what are you doing to me? Like she she. Didn't have any idea what was going on. But she was released wow. with the power of God. Wow. The awesome power of prayer. Believing in God. Putting God first in everything. Yes. And, and she was released. She turned her life to Jesus. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. We're so proud of you, man. We're honored to have you. Come on. I will build my church and the gates of hell cannot prevail. Amen, somebody. Thank God for not being afraid, Pastor Morocco. Praise the Lord. And thank you for not calling me. <laughs> Everybody say supernatural. So I want you to see this word binding and loosing is repeated in the New Testament. 
we're just not uh, making up, oh, those are just exorcism. Uh, work. No, they've been doing that even back in the day. And listen to what Jesus said. Look at this next, pic, next slide. In Luke chapter 13, there's a woman who's sick for sick 18, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, uh, 18 years. And this sickness is not psycho, it's not a physical, it's a demonic sickness. Some, some, some of her sickness is physical, some of a demonic attack. So this was a demonic attack upon a, a woman. So Jesus set her free. And it so happened Sabbath. And you know, for the Jewish people, Sabbath, you don't work, you don't do anything. For this embracing religion more than relationship. And so they confronted Jesus. And so this is what Jesus said to the, to the accuser. Uh, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound? Bound. Think of it. Jesus said, 18 years, loose, untied from this bond, from this bondage on Sabbath. You see that? So do you know that Satan will be bound for 1,000 years in the Revelation and then will release for a while? That's the millennial reign. So this is what happened in Revelation 20. Everybody read this together, Charisma. He lay hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, that's hell, and shut him up so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were, fi were finished, and then he will be released. Everybody say bound. Everybody say release. And now I want you to hear this Charisma. This is not just for Pastor Maroc. For every believer that accepts Jesus as Lord, God has given you the keys. Everybody read this with me, Charisma. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever what you bind on earth will be what? Bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be what? Loose, release, and tied in heaven. I want you to approach this not by Satan is stronger than me. You see that woman? How many men? Six men. Strong men putting down the woman. Though, and the man is, you cannot fight the devil by, by physical strength. We, this is stronger than us, physically speaking. But the devil is afraid is the authority of the believer because we carry the name of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Amen. So what is a picture of authority? It's like this old dude and this big football player, this is stronger than this man. But this man will be, can be stopped by this guy by throwing the red flag or yellow flag and say, Paul, stop. Because this person has authority over that dude. I want you to see that. The devil might be stronger than me, but I come against him not in the name of Jesus, but in the name of Jesus. And the devil is no match with Jesus. Amen, somebody. Amen. If you want to give a clap of Jesus, give on. Come on, church. Let's pray rise in the house. The devil has made us scared a lot of you guys. No, he should be the one scared of us. Amen. Because here the gates is retreating. We're moving on. Now, let me ask you this question. What if you have authority, but you don't know how to use it? Do you have authority? Yes or no? You have authority, but you don't know how to use it. Do you have authority? Technically, uh, yes, you have authority, but in reality, no, because you don't know how to use it. I will share to you charisma as, as a leader, as a pastor. This is my job description to, to equip the saints so that we'll not be harassed and demonized and, and be casualty of war. In fact, this, this is from Jesus Christ, and he gave this to us. How do we bind and loose? Binding and losing. Remember right after G Paul mentioning about the Roman soldier, can you look at the next slide about binding and losing? It says here, put, I want you to read this with me, Charisma. Pray. Everyone say pray. pray. Before, after that, put on helmet and then he said pray. So that's the spiritual, in the spirit at all times and keep on praying. So the first thing we do is pray. Everyone say pray. pray. I think for, for me, here's my analogy. On the ground is combat, sword, helmet, shoes, right? Spear. But sometimes we need some air support. How many of you during the Vietnam War, uh, on the ground, and then here comes the air support, the U.S. Air Force. How many of you have seen the shock and all, right? A precise missile. 
We have now drone attack. I call that, that's the power of prayer. That is calling the air support of heaven to come to you. Have you noticed that's why the devil doesn't want you to pray? How many of you sometimes when you're praying, you fall asleep? And you think that you have an overnight prayer meeting. You say, Jesus. And then you say, in Jesus' name, next morning. <laughs> <laughs> right? Have you noticed that? The devil will not stop you from serving, will not stop you from doing what. But when it comes to your prayer, oh, no, no, no. no. Oh, you're bored. And, uh, because the devil knows. You're calling some air support from heaven. And I'm telling you, when all hell break loose in your life, you need all heaven come to your rescue. Come on, somebody. But if you don't pray, you just open your life and your family for the harassment of the devil. That's why church prayer is very, very important. This year, 2023, the start was a little bit half. We're sad. COVID, people left, people move. We're, we're, we're just going through the motion. I'm just doing my, my faith, preaching. And then 21 day fasting. 21 day fasting, shut down. No, 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 no meat, no sweet, no treats, just water, beds on, visible only, and seeking God, praying. And my wife and I were praying, Lord, I know you're not done with charisma. You said in your word, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers, Lord God. God, right now, Lord, we're laboring. Lord, I ask you, Lord, send laborers, send people. Lord. After our 21-day fasting, I see one morning, 10 o'clock, there's this park, car that parked there. And I, I, first time I met Pastor Warren all the way from Bonnie Lake. Come on, somebody. Amen. <laughs> and Pastor Warren brought a lot of people. And then a, a lot of new people coming in and uh, coming in. And now we're back-to-back -back service. And they're moving the mission of Jesus. Everybody say, because we pray. Yeah. I ask you, church, Thursday night prayer meeting, one hour, come here. Sometimes we always talk on the phone. Why don't you go to the throne? Don't talk it out with people. Talk it out with God. Come on, talk it out with God. Amen? And then we have to persevere. Jesus said, for hours, they pray and persevere before that women was delivered from possession. Jesus said to his disciples that we should always, everybody say, that we should always what? Pray and not? What is this sign? Amazon Prime. Whenever you pray, it's going up. Everybody say, up. So this is how we fight our battle, church. War room. I like what Leonard Driven Hill said. Prayer is not the preparation for battle. Prayer is the battle. You want your husband to be saved? Battle it in prayer. Battle it in prayer. Battle it in prayer. Battle it in prayer, not by nagging, not by saying, oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 you don't win war like that. You battle, pray, go to a war room. Designate a room in your house for war room. Designate a, a spot where you have a place you entertain guests. Designate a spot. This is where I entertain Holy Spirit. This is your room. This is the war room. I'm going to cry here. I'm going to cry out to God. I'm going to battle it. I'm going to pray in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody. That's what you do. Then I'll ask you, church, I'll just say this once in, in a while. October is pastor's appreciation. I think you didn't hear it. <laughs> October is pastor's appreciation month. Oh, no more. Don't clap. That's courtesy clap. You offended me already. You should have said pastor appreciation. Ah! You know why you should pray for your pastor? Because we're on the front line. If the enemy could shut us, me down, our pastor, Pastor Will, all, all the, the flock suffers. Strike the shepherd. And so I ask you, appreciate them. I invite Pastor Murrow, invite Pastor Ariel, invite Pastor William, invite Pastor Chris, invite Pastor Bill. Take them out to lunch, take them out to dinner. Just, just let them know, good job, Pastor, we're praying for you. 
Paul, uh, Paul did this, right? He said this in Ephesians 6, 19. Everybody reads together. Paul saying, also pray, pray, pray for me. I'm also under attack that whenever I speak the word, that will fearlessly. You know why you should pray for pastor? Here's the reality, church. Look at this. 97% of pastors have been betrayed, falsely accused, or hurt by their trusted friends. 70% of pastors battle depression. Last night, I was, we were in, Friday night, we were in the multi-ethnic pastors gathering. I saw some of my multi-ethnic friends there. And this one from pastor from Tonga said, the battle's so tough, pastor. I have to quit for one year. I, get, I didn't do any ministry. I just went on a sabbatical because the depression is so real. And then I said, thank you for coming back. Get back up. I'm praying for you. But pastors are human too. That's why Monday is my day off. What I do, I go to the gym. I just let all my stress on the weekend. I'm giving, and sometimes people will call me. And then I will say, Pastor, would you not return my call? Sister, it's Monday. It's my day off. You know what this sister told me? The devil never takes a day off. <laughs> you know what I told this sister? That's why I'm taking a day off. I don't want to become like the devil. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. Jesus took a day off. Amen. Sixth day and the seventh day, you want rest. Of course, you could still call me but in case of emergency, but what means I say, I need this. I need the relaxation. I need this. I need to get away too. 7,000 churches have closed. In the Pacific Northwest, as Pastor Bill, we, have, we planted 70 churches. 35 of them closed down in the span of two years. 1,500 pastors quit every month. Every month. Imagine every month. 10,000 already retiring. 80% of pastors feel discouraged. 90% of pastors' family, my wife, my kids, felt the pressure of ministry. 78% of pastors have no close friend. That is sad. And 90% of pastors report working 55 to 75 hours. You know, some of you are very uh, observant. Bill, uh, Pastor, uh, Brother Alex, sometimes he calls me, Pastor, how many hours did it take you to prepare a sermon with those illustration with those pictures and those research and I said minimum 20 hours as my wife from from Monday already researching preparing because I don't want to waste your time we have people coming from Bonnie Lake from Black Diamond from Marysville every Sunday and I want to make sure that when you come here you will hear the word of God come on somebody and you will hear the message of the Lord amen because some people think that what does a pastor do just show up on Sunday no. So everybody say pray. pray. Would you promise to pray for us? Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. Number two, everybody say proclaim. Amen. When you're speaking and witnessing, you're binding the devil. That's why, have you noticed that the devil doesn't want you to share? Be, keep your faith to yourself. Can I ask you, do your co-workers know you're a Christian? Do your neighbors know you're a Christian or you hide it? Just like uh, one believer is saying, we're all in the army of God. We're all in the soldier of the Lord. And they said, how about you? What, what, what are you? I belong to the secret service. You don't need to be in the secret service. Come on, somebody. God is alive and you don't need to be ashamed of him. Amen, somebody. You need to proclaim. Listen to what Paul says. After you prayed for him, everybody say, look at this word. And utterance, every utterance. What's that? Speak the word. Be given to you that you might speak it boldly. And then pray for me that I'll be a good ambassador to represent Jesus Christ that I'll speak boldly. Remember what Jesus asked? Who do you say I am? In the midst of these idols, idolatry left and right. And then Peter proclaimed, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Look at this picture. Who do you people say I am? Look at this. Picture this in mind when Jesus was going there in, in Caesarea Philippi. 
Back in the day, all of those are idols. Those are just grottos, grottos. All kinds of idols are there. All kinds of idols there. And Jesus is walking and asked the disciple, who do people say I am? And he was looking at this. Am I the God of Zeus, the God of Pan, the God of who? And Peter got it. Peter got the, got the right answer and said, ah, uh, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah. But this is what Jesus said, Peter, not just don't name drop, don't say what Sam says. You, who do you say I am? Can I ask you, who is Jesus to you? Not according to Pastor James, not according to Pastor Warren, not according to what the preacher did. Who do you say Jesus is? That's a very important question. And Peter said, for me, you are the Messiah. Not the God of Pan. Not Caesar. Not all those idols. You are the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. I'm telling you, when Peter said that, boom! There's like every demon in hell run and scared because there's someone who is proclaiming who Jesus is. I'm telling you, the devil should be the one afraid of us, not us afraid of him. That's why I ask you, keep praying and saying, witnessing. Tell them. Christianity is not a disease that you should keep it to yourself. It's not a religion. No, tell them your encounter with Jesus. Tell them your story. Tell them your relationship. At the gym, they know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I'm, I don't just praise the Lord here. I praise the Lord in the gym. One time I was bench pressing. I, I cannot do the 225. And then I said, oh! And then I said, praise the Lord! And the guys look at me. And then I told my friends, guys, when you always say your app bombs, I'm not offended. Let's have equal airtime in the gym. <laughs> Come on, somebody, amen. I'll speak my Jesus and whatever you want to speak. Come on, somebody. The point I'm trying to say, don't hide. Because when you hide, that's where the devil comes. But when you say, you speak, you expose the devil. And here's the thing, what's happening in America today. The pressure on preaching the word of God. Right? Here's what the Bible says. For a time is coming when people will not listen to the truth anymore. But we'll gather around looking for teachers who will tell them just what they want to hear. Pastor, just entertain me. Make me happy. Make me laugh. Make me jump. Don't convict me of sin. No, 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 no. That's, they won't listen to what the Bible says, but they will follow their own misguided ideas. One of my heroes as a preacher is Dr. Adrian Rogers, who passed away. This is what he said. It is better to speak the truth that hurts and then heals than falsehood that comforts and then kills. It is not love. It is not friendship. We fail to declare the whole counsel of God. It's better to be hated for telling the truth than to be loved for telling a lie. It's better to stand alone with the truth than to be wrong with the multitude. Amen, somebody. Here's Apostle Paul. What happened in Ephesus? He spoke the truth that Jesus is Lord. And there's a temple there, the Diana Temple, the other gods there. And he preached the word of God. And the people were set free from de demon possession too. And listen to this charisma. This became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. Fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had believed, means they're Christian already, confessed telling their deeds. What does it mean, Pastor? There are a lot of Christians that are like this. One foot with Jesus, the other foot with the devil. One foot in the kingdom of God and the other foot in the kingdom of the world. If you are positioned like this, you'll just be an easy target of the devil. What I'm trying to say, if you're with Jesus, go all the way with Jesus. Come on, somebody. Amen. So those people who are doubling in the occult, magic arts, and when they heard about these demons who were witchcraft and got possessed and got delivered, the Christians come out in the open. Look at this. Many of them have practiced magic, brought their books together, and burned 
them in the sight of all. And they counted the value. It's like 50,000 pieces. They did not have the garage sale and gave away those old CDs or pornographic materials or, or whatever. No, they burned it because they're coming out. It's coming out. This week, another example of the power of dark, God over darkness. A well-known witchcraft in Hollywood and tattoo artist. Her name is Kat Von D. Got baptized in water, a symbol of a follower of Jesus. She's well-known with that. And this is what he, she did before the water baptism. Look at this next slide. I don't know if any of you have been going through changes in your lives right now. But in the last few years, I've come to some pretty amazing or uh, meaningful realization. Many of them involving around the fact that I got a lot of things wrong in my past. These are all the witchcraft books that he uses to cast spell on people, on the people that he tattoo artists. And then he, she burned it. She got rid of it. And everybody say, proclaim. Everybody say, proclaim. <laughs> Last but not the least. You know, that's the next weapon we can use. Pray, you proclaim the word. Everybody say, praise. praise. Can I ask you a favor, charisma? I'm going to open everybody today. Some of you come to church. I don't want to go to the singing. It's just preliminary. I'm going to go to the word of God. That's the main event. Wrong. Church. Do you know most of the miracles happen while we're worshiping, while we're singing? Come on, somebody. Did you know that praise is a weapon? I'm calling on my, my, my band today, my ushers, to, uh, my worship team, maybe get, get ready. Everybody read this together. Let the high, come on, let the high praises of God be in our mouth and the two-edged sword. I want you to know this. Look at this next slide, Charisma. I just want to challenge you. I googled this, the top five loudest stadiums, sports stadium in the world. That's so loud. Number five, University of Tennessee, Neyland Stadium, 100,000 people shouting every Saturday to their sports idol, to their sports team. Number four, do I have a witness here? Lumenfield. That's why some of you don't complain if the church is too loud. But you go to the, to the stadium and it's so loud and you don't complain. Come on, somebody. What you do when you see this sign in Lumen Stadium? Look at this next slide. When you see that, oh my gosh. It's like, oh, it's so loud. That's number four. You know what's number three, church? The loudest stadium in the world? Number three. Let's go all the way to LSU Tiger Stadium. You know what's number four? Let's read this together. Number four. Look at the next slide, please. Everybody read that. And say it again for ten times. <laughs> I can't even read that. That's in Germany. But the number one loudest stadium in the world is in Arrowhead Stadium where the Kansas City Chiefs play 142.2 dB. You know what's 142? 2.2 decibel is the sound of the engine of the jet that is taking off. And these people are shouting their hearts out to a sports personality, to a team that they love. What about us? We serve a God who is alive and is here for us today, Charisma, and He will never leave us. Can we give Him a clap of praise? Come on, somebody. Can we shout to God? With the voice of triumph, stand up on your feet. Come on, somebody. Where Jesus is Lord. Jesus is better than Taylor Swift. Come on, somebody. Jesus is greater than any sports. Team. He deserves the best. He deserves the glory. I'm gonna say, uh, say this first, and then I will ask the worship team. We're gonna do something here, and then we'll ask the Holy Spirit to lead us. You know why praise is so powerful? How many of you have heard the testimony of Pastor Morocco? I want to show you this picture. This is the American missionary who stormed the gates of hell in the Marshall Island. His name is Sam Sasser. Just show it, Ate. The first missionary in Marshall Island. When he arrived in Marshall Island, the chief tribe said, You're a missionary. We're not ready for that religion or Jesus stuff. Without you, wrestling our champion so they have a champion wrestler 
this guy grew up in LA, used to be a wrestler. Said, oh, okay, I can do that. He wrestled the champion, wrestling match. And the, 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 the wrestler from Marshall is tapped out, submit. And then he said, can you now read it to me to, to hear the pro Jesus? No, we will not listen to you until you encounter our supernatural champion. They're out there in their bonfire. And this two lady came out, true story, levitated, levitated, levitated. And the chief tribe told Sam, do you think your God could do that? And Sam said, no, my God is not into levitation, but my God can pull them down. He bind it and he loose it in the name of Jesus. These two women drop and the knee of the other lady broken. And Sam laid hands on the lady and was healed miraculously. And that's how Jesus won in the island of Marshall, this island. I'm telling you, upon this rock. But you know what was he doing? When the ladies were levitating, you know what Sam did? According to their story, he just lifted my hands and started clapping and cheering on and say, Jesus, you are Lord of the witchcraft. God, you're stronger than this. And then she just praised him. And then the demon. That's what the devil sometimes I ask you, clap your hands, church, in the church. It's worship. Raise your hands. Come on, somebody. Sing it out. Come on, somebody. I want you to experience this with me. Second Kings 11:12. They brought the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they proclaimed him king and anointed him. Everybody say, they clapped their hands and said, Long live. It's automatic. When you're in the presence of royalty, the king entered. They stand up. They clap. They said, Long live the king. We have King Jesus in the house. Come on, somebody. We have the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Why don't we clap to the Lord? Come on. Come on. If you want to dance here in the altar, come on, come forward. Let's worship God. Come on. Let's be love for Jesus. Don't hold back, church. There's, the, there's people, depression going out. There's healing coming right now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I praise you in the valley. I praise on the mountain hey, hey. I praise when I'm sure I praise when I'm doubting hey, hey. I praise when outnumbered Praise when surrounded Cause praise is the water That my enemies drowned in as long as I'm breathing, I got a reason to praise the Lord of my soul. I'm a singing now, praise the Lord of my soul. I praise when I feel it, and I praise when I don't. Come on, I praise cause I know. He's still in control Cause my weapon is It's more than a sound Yes it is My praise is the shout That brings Jericho down And as long as I'm breathing
Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true Praise cause nobody is greater than you See it again, I praise Hey! to sing this strong trust in God I'm gonna be offensive to you right now who do you say Jesus is don't say some says uh, he's God some says he's Messiah some no I'm asking about you today that's the most important question who is Jesus to you Peter got it right in the midst of all the Id idols in Caesarea he said you are the Messiah. You're the Savior, the Son of the living God. That's the only way you get to have the keys. Because Jesus will not give the keys if you're not a child of the King. It's not re I'm not saying about joining this church. No, I'm saying opening your heart and receiving Him, Lord. Say, God, I heard a lot of stuff about you. But I want you to make it personal. Who do you say Jesus is? And then I will ask us, Richard, to sing this song, to trust in. There's a big difference between I trust in God. It means you give your whole life to God. I pray you answer this correctly, church. Who is Jesus to you? Jesus is the way, the truth the life no one comes to the father but through him maybe today is the day of i declare that this is the day of salvation to you that we will settle this issue i love charisma i love going during bugan playing golf games fun eating i love but today is more than that it's to have an encounter with jesus christ would you pray this prayer with me charisma we're gonna pray this aloud and no no one will be put but you want you to out of your mouth from your heart, you declare that Jesus is Lord, and out of the confession of that pound, you will be saying, Everyone will say, Dear God, Dear God today is the day I made up my mind, I opened my heart, I believe in Jesus. You are my Savior, you are my Lord, you are my God. I can do a lot of things, but there's one thing I cannot do. I cannot save my life. I am lost without you. I'm helpless without you. But I am saved with you. And today, Jesus, say this today, Jesus, I declare and decree you are the Messiah. You are Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, my Savior, 
my Lord, my best friend. There's still be the attitude of worship. I want you to sing this as a song. Make this your prayer. And while you're singing this, I want you to leave all your burdens, your worry, and your fear, anxiety, everything. Give it out to God. Give it all the way to Jesus. He can handle you, charisma. If the devil could handle the devil, he can handle anything that comes against us. We have not to be fear, but to trust in him.
we will never in God my Savior the one who will never fail he will never fail and I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord, and He heard me answer. I sought the Lord, and He heard me answer. That's why I trust Him. For the last time, church. I'd like to ask Pastor Warren to say a benediction, a prayer. Remember, church, our hero said, Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell cannot overcome. I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind here on earth will be bound in earth. Whatever you loose in earth will be loose. Loose in heaven will be loose in heaven. He's given you the authority. Jesus will not rebuke the devil for you. Because he's given you the keys. You have to use it. In that name. Although you're weak, he is strong. Although we have a lot of limitation, your God is unlimited. You just link up and connect, and the Holy Spirit flows in you and through you. Pray, proclaim, praise. This week, why don't you use those weapons? When you feel like you're worrying and panicking, that the God of pan panic is attacking you, pray right away. Then you share, you declare. You know, telling people about Jesus in your life, you're, you're binding the demons. I'm saying, telling you, will, you will see that. You will experience the miracle. And then you praise. No matter how life is hard, God is good. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Jesus said, only the dead will not praise me maybe some time church listen to me one of the signs you're spiritually dead because you're not praising god you're dying but you're alive in christ let everything that has breath praise the lord the breath that you have comes from the lord use it to praise him to worship him Pastor Warren will come and pray for us today. Hallelujah. Thank you, O Lord. Truly, Lord, in your presence, there's fullness of gladness. As what Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And we say to you, O God, you are our strength, our fortress. In you, we will trust. Father, I declare provision and blessing to your people. Bless them in their family. Bless them in the field. Bless them in the city. Bless them in their homes. 
May you make them the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, the lender and not the borrower. And no evil, Lord God, formed against them shall ever prosper, because you are our mighty shield and our fortress. May all that we bind and loose here on earth may be bind and loose in heaven. And all God's people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you.